Football season is here, so I thought I'd highlight 12 NFL players who chose service over self and in the process made the ultimate sacrifice. The first is Keith Berlin. Following a Hall of Fame career at San Jose State as a quarterback, he moved to the end position where he played the 1939 season in the NFL for the Cardinals, and then he was traded midseason to the Washington Redskins, where he was a teammate of Sammy Baugh. A few years later, Burlam was the commander of the Army Air Corps 508th Bombardment Squadron, 351st Bombardment Group Heavy, stationed at Polebrook, Northamptonshire, England, flying the B-17. After a May 4, 1943 bombing mission over German-occupied Belgium to take out an automobile plant, his plane was heavily damaged, but he managed to get it back on the ground. Three days later, on a training mission, his B-17, which was nicknamed Vicious Virgin, collided with another B-17 bomber, and everybody was killed on both airplanes. Philadelphia Eagle Nick Baska played his last NFL game on December 7, 1941, the day the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Three days later, he enlisted in the United States Army. He wound up being assigned as a tank commander and was sent to England in December of 1943 to join Patton's famed 3rd Army. He was part of the 4th Armored Division. That division trained as a decoy for the forthcoming invasion of Normandy because the Allied intelligence knew that Hitler was convinced that Patton would lead any invasion into Nazi-occupied Europe. Patton was somebody that the Germans feared. Basca landed at Normandy about a month after D-Day, and with the 3rd Army swept across France, 250 miles to the city of Nancy. On November 11, 1944, his tank was hit by a German 88mm round, and he was killed. Charlie Behan caught four passes for 63 yards in 1942, which was his only year with the Detroit Lions. He joined the Marine Corps shortly thereafter. In 1944, he was part of the 6th Marine Division at Guadalcanal. While he was there, he played a legendary touch football game on Christmas Eve between two regiments. He was the 29th Marines player coach, and the game ended in a scoreless tie. That game was called the Football Classic. Those same Marines were shipped to Okinawa in April of 1945. Behan was involved in the Battle of Sugarloaf Hill and was hit with shrapnel in the mouth. But instead of fading back to an aid station, he applied cotton to his mouth and kept fighting. After tossing grenades at a Japanese machine gun nest, he was hit by machine gun fire and killed. He was posthumously awarded the Navy Cross for his actions. Al Blosis was a Hall of Fame tackle at Georgetown University before being drafted by the New York Giants and starring as a tackle with them for three years. He joined the Army in 1943, despite being much too tall for standards. At six foot six, he broke the Army's grenade-throwing record before being shipped out to lead a platoon of troops in France. In 1944, after two of his men were lost in the Vosges Mountains in France, he set out to find them by himself and was never heard from again. The words dedicated to the men and women of the armed services are displayed on the wall of Soldier Field in Chicago. While they have had several football players serve in the United States military, there's only one that was killed in action, and that's Young Bussey. Young Bussey played college football at LSU, where he was the team captain. As a result, he was invited to try out for the Chicago Bears. So he was drafted in the 1940 NFL Draft. He established a reputation for being kind of a wise-ass he reportedly once told the Bears owner, George Hallis, that, quote, he'd come to be a winner and the coach needed to either trade Sid Luckman, who was their starting quarterback, or keep him on as Bussey's backup. He was sent down to the Newark Bears that year, but did wind up being Luckman's backup in 1941. Before the 1942 season, and moments after he finished playing in the annual Chicago College All-Star Game, Bussey informed Hallis he was going to enlist to fight in World War II. The next day, he joined the Naval Reserve, and soon thereafter, he was sent to OCS. Bussey achieved the rank of Lieutenant JG and was eventually assigned to the USS Warren, which was an attack transport in the Pacific. He served on 10 different missions, including the 1944 Battle of Guam, where he received a commendation from the 5th Fleet Commander, Admiral Raymond Spruance. Bussey had served as an assistant beachmaster for that assault, but he was promoted to head beachmaster for the upcoming invasion of Lingigan Gulf in the Philippines. So while he was home before that invasion, he confessed to his older brother, who was a combat engineer in the Army, that he believed he would not come out of his next landing alive. And he actually gave his brother a commemorative watch from the 1941 championship game. And the night before he landed on the beaches of Lingigan Gulf, 
Bussey turned over his personal effects to the ship's chaplain and told him, tomorrow I make my ascension. Will you see that my mother gets these? So his vision unfortunately proved to be correct and he was killed on January 7th, 1945 when his landing craft took a direct hit from a Japanese mortar after it got stuck on a coral reef about 75 yards from the beach. Jack Cheveny is part of Notre Dame football history. He played three seasons as right halfback, 26 to 28, and he scored the winning touchdown against Army on November 10th, 1928 in Yankee Stadium after the Newt Rockney win one for the Gipper halftime speech. After he scored, he yelled, that one's for the Gipper as he crossed the goal line. Cheveny became the assistant football coach under Rockney in 29, and Notre Dame went undefeated in the next two seasons and won two national championships. Now, while he was coaching, he also received his law degree from Notre Dame, and he left the school after Rockney's death in an airplane crash in March of 1931. He went on to coach the Chicago Cardinals to a 2-6-2 two, and two record in 1932. He left that position to become the head coach at St. Edwards University, and then he went on to coach the University of Texas. While coach of the Longhorns, he beat Notre Dame and finished the 1934 season 7-2-1. and one. Follow-on seasons didn't go as well, and in 1937, he resigned the coaching position and was appointed the Deputy Attorney General of Texas. In March of 1943, Cheveny was drafted into the Army after trying to enlist and being rejected because he had a knee injury that he received while playing football at Notre Dame. So that's a little confusing that he's drafted because he can't enlist. In any case, after he completed basic training, he requested and was granted an inter-service transfer to the United States Marine Corps. Eventually, he was commissioned in the Marine Corps, and in September of 1943, he was actually the assistant coach of the Camp Lejeune football team. In late 1943, he requested an overseas combat assignment. He ultimately landed as part of the 27th Marines on Iwo Jima's Red Beach 1 on February 19, 1945, and was killed in action. Howard Smiley Johnson played three years at the University of Georgia before joining the Green Bay Packers for the 1940 and 41 seasons. After that, he joined the Marine Corps and became an officer. In addition to seeing combat with the 1st Marine Division, he played for the service football team in Hawaii. He served through the battles of Kwajalein, Saipan, and Tinian. On February 19, 1945, he was killed in action by a mortar shell at Iwo Jima and awarded a second Silver Star posthumously. Jack Loomis played only nine games for the New York Giants before enlisting during the 1941 season. He eventually became an officer and trained with the elite Marine Raiders, which is the precursor to what we know now as MARSOC. Loomis was one of the first Marines to land on Iwo Jima, and for two weeks he directed artillery fire onto Japanese positions on Mount Suribachi. He was wounded by shrapnel but managed to knock out three Japanese fortifications so his Marines could advance. He then lost both legs to a landmine and died in an aid station. He was awarded the Medal of Honor for his leadership and conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. Walter Waddy Young was a first consensus All-American football player out of the University of Oklahoma, and he led the Sooners to their first ever Orange Bowl game. After college, he was drafted by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Yes, that was an NFL team back then. And he played in the league's first televised game. 1941, he gave up his NFL career to join the United States Army Air Corps. He wanted to fly fighters, but he was told he was too big, so he became a B-24 Liberator bomber pilot. In 1942, he was a member of a B-24 anti-submarine patrol that took part in the Battle of the Atlantic against the Luftwaffe. He served in the European theater through 1943 and saw combat at the Bay of Biscay. Between June and December of that year, he flew 25 combat missions and received a bronze oak leaf cluster on his air medal. He tried again to be a fighter pilot, but was rejected for the P-47 Thunderbolt program, and he was transferred to the Pacific Theater in 1944, where he went from the Liberator to the B-29 Super Fortress. He was a captain of a B-29 that was nicknamed Wadi's Wagon. The crew was one of the first B-29s to bomb Tokyo. On January 9th of 1945, Wadi's Wagon was returning from a bombing mission on the Nakajima Aircraft Company in Tokyo when Young spotted a B-29 with severe damage from a kamikaze attack. As Young was attempting to protect the damaged airplane from further kamikaze attacks, he had a mid-air with it, and all crew involved were killed. 
Bob Kalsu was drafted by the Buffalo Bills out of the University of Oklahoma. He was a starting guard for the 1968 season. He was recognized as the Bills Rookie of the Year. Following that season, to satisfy his ROTC obligation that he incurred while at the University of Oklahoma, he entered the U.S. Army as a second lieutenant and arrived in South Vietnam in November of 1969 as part of the 101st Airborne Division. On July 21st, 1970, Kalsu was killed in action at the Battle of Fire Support Base Ripcord when his unit came under enemy 82mm mortar fire while stationed near the Asa Valley in Thua Tien Province. He was killed just hour before his wife gave birth to their son, their second child, back home. As a side note, he was the only active professional athlete among the 58,220 Americans killed in the Vietnam War. Don Steinbrenner was an end from Washington State and played offensive tackle in 1953 for the Cleveland Browns. Steinbrenner, who, like Kalsu, joined ROTC while in college, was called to active duty following his rookie season with Cleveland. When he finished a two-year tour of duty as an Air Force navigator, he thought about returning to the Browns, but instead decided to pursue a military career. In 1966, Steinbrenner was called to serve in Vietnam. Not long after his arrival, he was shot in the knee during an aerial mission. Due to his injury, he was offered the opportunity to accept a less dangerous assignment, but he declined and returned to his unit instead. Steinbrenner was on a defoliation mission over Vietnam on July 20th, 1967, when his C-123 provider was shot down over Kantum, South Vietnam. He was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Purple Heart. Citation reads, in part, Disregarding the hazards of flying the difficult target terrain and the opposition presented by hostile ground forces, he led the formation through one attack and returned to make a second attack. The outstanding heroism and selfless devotion to duty displayed by Major Steinbrenner reflect great credit upon himself and the United States Air Force. Pat Tillman had been a stand-up defensive end at Arizona State when he was drafted in the 1998 NFL draft by the Arizona Cardinals. The Cardinals moved him to safety, and he started 10 of the 16 games in his rookie season. So Tillman racked up some impressive stats during his three years with the Cardinals. But in May of 2002, eight months after the September 11th attacks, after completing the 15 remaining games of the 01 season, which followed the attacks, he turned down a contract offer of $3.6 million over three years to enlist in the U.S. Army. So Pat and his brother Kevin enlisted on Memorial Day of 2002. They completed basic training together. They also completed the Ranger Assessment and Selection Program in late 2002 and were assigned to the 2nd Ranger Battalion. They participated in the initial invasion of Iraq. And then in September of 2003, Pat entered Ranger School, graduated November 28th of 03. He was redeployed to Afghanistan, and he was based at Fob Salerno, which I visited during my embed there. On April 22nd of 2004, he was initially reported to have been killed by enemy combatants. His platoon leader and one of their radio telephone operators were wounded in that same incident. The Army initially claimed that Tillman and his unit were attacked in an ambush, and it was not until after he was buried, DOD investigations revealed that he was killed as a result of friendly fire. This was a messy episode for the Tillman family and the U.S. Army. Tillman was posthumously awarded the Silver Star, but the commendation makes no mention of the friendly fire incident, but instead states, caught between the crosshair of an enemy near ambush, Corporal Tillman put himself in the line of devastating enemy fires, maneuvered his fire team to a covered position from which he could effectively employ weapons on known enemy positions. So there you have it, 12 former NFL players that put service over self and made the ultimate sacrifice. So while you're enjoying football this season, keep them in mind. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber so you don't miss anything. Give me the likes and comment. If you'd like to help support this channel, please consider hitting the heart with a dollar sign on it below. That's super thanks in the comments. Or becoming a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. Also check the links below for t-shirts and mugs, and where to get the forthcoming reissue of the Punk Trilogy coming soon from Naval Institute Press. And as always, I look forward to talking to you again soon.